Sure. I mean, I've been primarily a screenwriter for most of my life. Um, so that's just something that uh, I've been doing, you know, for money and there's jobs. And um, I wrote a movie called Raising Victor Vargas, which was my first film, and then continued writing. And uh, I had always wanted to direct. So like you said, I directed some shorts, some music videos. And then as for everybody, you know, getting your first feature done and finance is a struggle for everyone. Um, so it just took me longer than I would have wanted it to do. But uh, yeah, I guess you could say transition-wise, I came at it from a screenwriting point of view. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's hard for everyone, but I also, as we are now finding out, if you're you know, a member of a so-called minority, it can be even harder because your point of view isn't necessarily that of the mainstream. It didn't feel that way to me. In a way, it, in a way, it was more liberating, I guess, because, you know, for better or for worse, I was mostly left to my own devices in this, which is the good thing that can come out of um, having a smaller budget movie that, you know, you don't necessarily have to cast a huge actor or something like that. And so I think also because people knew it was my personal story, they were less... Uh, inclined to give me notes or to question certain things. Um, I mean, also because I had the answers to them, you know, They're like, oh yeah, she's like this because of this and this and this. So, uh, no, and that part, it wasn't, I don't think it was harder. Um, each script and story has their own, um, you know, difficulties. Um, but the personal part wasn't one of them. I mean, I would say the only thing that was a little hard was writing that her breakdown on stage, because I think it was a you know, it was more of a tone thing of, like, how rageful does she go on there, you know? Like, I think there was a version where she could have been, like, Carrie sending the whole club on fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that was a little, that, that was the only thing that was kind of hard to write and, and to shoot was also pretty emotional. Well, it was just, um, comedy was something that I had followed pretty early on, in particular Richard Pryor, once I found out about him, and I was, you know, I think very surprised and shocked to hear how much he spoke about his own abuse and how brutally he did on stage, which honestly is still shocking today, uh, specifically for a man and specifically for a black man. You know, I think men have their own issues in terms of owning up to this kind of abuse, and he just did it really openly. and. Uh, it, it's not particularly funny when he does, it's just honest, which is another thing that I'm attracted to in comedy as well as in life, that sometimes, you know, and I try to do this with uh, Nina, like some of the stuff she says isn't that funny, it's just that it's honest and in recognizing that we laugh, you know? So it was, there was a lot about comedy that, um, that I liked and that made sense to me for her. And I also really liked the idea of having a woman protagonist who is creative and who has a voice and who uses that voice for her profession, that she's able to state her opinions on things. And I also like the contrast of that with what's going on in her own, in her personal life. Um, so we mostly just talked a lot about her <laughs> and some about me. I mean, I gave her a lot of information and sort of background uh, on you know, what things were like for me growing up and why she might feel certain things like, and, and you know, she's such an accomplished actress that obviously a lot of the times you just, yeah, most of the time we would just like get dinner and talk for three or four hours and then go to sleep and then have that work in your subconscious or, or use it for, you know, like for example, there's a line in the breakdown, so it comes later in the in the movie where she talks about how, you know, she has to fight the instinct of, breaking a beer bottle over a guy's head who just wants her number or directions. So that's something that, you know, you're not aware of it at the moment, but she's really using that in the beginning of the film when, you know, somebody comes up to her or even Rafe when she meets him. Like, in the back of her head, she's kind of like, is this guy going to be dangerous? And, you know, am I fighting the instinct of <laughs> breaking a beer bottle over his head? So, again, it's things that aren't necessarily obvious or set, but that an actor like Mary can really use and and work with. Um, and, you know, I think she's pretty remarkable, and I'm grateful every day that I got to do that 
with her. It was really painless. I mean, I know it sounds weird to say that we mostly just talked about it, but that is kind of how it went. She doesn't really like to rehearse, and I, I now understand why. <laughs> I agree, and it's hilarious because she's nothing like that. And that was, you know, I, I, it was amazing to me to to see her take that on. Like, I remember also, and, you know, of course, how committed she is because in real life she's very kind of shy and so sweet and, you know, just the nicest person ever. And then you turn on the camera and she would just turn that on, which, I mean, I, I guess, again, that's what actors do. And I think I'm sure there's a part of her that also really enjoyed playing that kind of character. But I remember one time when she was doing that early scene with Jay Moore, um, where he keeps asking her, if, you know, she's going to fuck him. And I think Jay had forgotten his line. So he said at some point, can you say that again? And <laughs> she just stayed in character. And she was like, no, fuck you. And he was like, no, can you just tell me the line again? <laughs> You know, so it was kind of interesting to see her, like, stay in that Nina mode, which is not what she would do as Mary, you know? Oh, thank you so much for asking about that. I always feel like cinematographers and editors and, you know, production designers, like the head of departments in movies, do so much work and contribute so much creatively and in every other way to movies, and we don't talk about them as much as we really should. And yeah, Tom is, is an incredible collaborator and, and DP. Um, we, you know, I remember we talked a little bit about comedians as if they were vampires, because they really do kind of live by night, you know? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I was in that world. <laughs> I was never a comedian, but I, I was in that world a lot when I first moved to New York. And I also was a night owl until I became a mom, because once you do that, you can't really work through the night anymore. Uh, or at least I can't. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I would, you know, I would often like go out at night and go see a couple of shows and then come back and do my writing, you know, start at two or three in the morning. So we talked a lot about that and how dark those places are. There's always a lot of red in, in comedy clubs, and I really like that. And I use that for Nina's color as well. Like, even though, I mean, she's obviously always dressed in black, but then she'll wear like the red lipstick and the red boots, like these little flashes there. And that I thought complemented the clubs really well. I really love darkness in movies, you know, so um, we use that a lot, obviously, in the monologue as well, to just kind of let everything else fall off and just have her be there on her own, because she really is being truthful and is naked, you know? Um, so that was a big part of it, and in a way, you know, it was... It helped us to shoot that way anyway, in terms of how little time we had, and, you know, not a ton of means either. Um, and then by contrast, to start opening up the light and, and the spaces when she gets to L.A. as she continues to open up, you know. So, for example, at Ray's house, everything feels much more airy and uh, not black, not red, <laughs> you know, more like sort of earth tones that I think would complement a character like his, you know. I love the way the movie looks like that, and I think it gives it much more of a cinematic um extension, I guess, which is not really what you see with comedies, although, then again, this isn't really like a straight-up comedy either. Yeah, I think it's very funny. I hope people laugh. I know I keep thinking I should give people permission to laugh, but, you know, that's the way it's been in my life, I guess, and that's probably why I also really like comedians, because, um, you know, to me, it's that mixture of, it's funny, because, you know, you laugh because it's true, right? So to me, the truth, a lot of the times, doesn't stop from being funny as well as fucked up. Like, those two things can coexist together. So I don't know. Um, it's, I guess it's my own dark sense of humor. But I know I'm not the only one. Yeah, I agree. Like, I think some of these comedians are, you know, like I remember when I first saw, is it bigger and blacker? Like the Chris Rock, um, his writing is incredible. And again, so ahead of his time where, you know, where he was saying, uh, if, if we may, if we asked for $5,000 for each bullet, the, the rate of death would diminish, in, you know, incredibly well. Like, again, you laugh because your instinct is to say, oh, that's so funny. But if you think about it, you're like, no, if he's like putting his finger on a major problem here and, you know, I mean, just to name one person, but he 
has always been so political in his writing and in his humor to call it something. And obviously, you know, George Carlin, uh, you know, Ali Wong more recently in terms of so many of the women who are giving voice to, again, what it's like to be a mother in comedy, what it's like to, you know, give birth and get on stage afterwards. So, you know, all of that stuff, it's, uh, it's all taken from their lives. And I really appreciate the honesty as well as the laughter, you know. You know, probably mostly a gift from the film gods, probably. But, uh, but you know, I think one of the things you do as a director is, first of all, it's true, you never really know with chemistry. I mean, I, you know, it's like, how would I know if they're going to get along or not? So I, so I remember the first time I we didn't really rehearse with them because I didn't want them to get too chummy because since they meet in the movie and so much of the beginning of their relationship is that they're kind of odd, they're not odd couple, you know, their energies aren't really matched up at all. So I kind of wanted to keep as much of that in the beginning as possible, which I think is kind of awkward, but I like it. And I think it's realistic until, really, until she goes to his house that night. It's not quite happening for them, you know? Um, so I just had them read um, their scenes together a couple of times one afternoon. And I remember, like, when I first saw them together and they first started reading and I was like, I just took this big sigh of relief because I was like, oh, it's going to work. Like, they're totally cool together and it's, you know, it'll be fine. But you don't really know, regardless of how talented they each are, because it is obviously a very intimate um, relationship that they have. And then, yeah, in terms of that sequence, most of it, as a director, I've learned that setting the mood is really important. Um... And the beauty with that sequence was that we were at Rave's house. We shot there for about three days, which is really the longest time we stayed at any one location. So that already was given us a little bit more of a relaxed atmosphere. We could always come back to the same place. It was in a very pretty area of the, of the city. And then the other thing I had discovered about, you know, obviously Common is a musician, and but so is Mary. And I realized over working with them that music really affects them. So I played a lot of music on the set, and I think that went a long way. You know, it's like we were all, a lot of us were kind of like dancing and talking about music and letting them bond that way so that then, you know, when it was time to shoot, we had still all whatever sound of what music was playing in our heads and, you know, it lent itself to the like kind of intimate dance that they do throughout that whole evening. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the funnest things to shoot for sure. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I love it, too. It was a very weird thing to write because it did feel like its own short movie inside of the film in a way. And so it was a bit of a risk to do it that way because it could have been, if it hadn't worked, then it would have just sort of, you know, ground the whole thing to a halt. But I'm glad that it didn't. And again, to me, it was, despite the fact that they end up having sex, my main thing was that I need to see them building intimacy, which is, again, I think something that movies often skirt over, like you'll get the fallen in love montage, but you don't actually know why they fell in love with each other. You know, it's like a lot of visuals of them eating ice cream and laughing, but you don't know what they're laughing about or what it is that they actually like about each other. And I always find that really weird in movies. I'm like, why don't we see? I know that it doesn't just have to be one moment. I'm so glad. Yeah, he's pretty great. I love his portrayal of Rafe, too. And, yeah, I think the fact that they were so comfortable with each other also allowed for some improv and some funny moments. Like, I always had that line where, you know, which is a tiny Spinal Tap reference where he says, you know, our drummer died, and, and then the 90s ended. And, uh, you know, and she said, oh, I'm sorry, that must be so hard for you. And then Common just added on his own, I want them back. <laughs> Which always makes me laugh so much because it also feels like a little bit self-referential. Like he had such a great time in the 90s too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like I'm doing my job right if the writing is where they start off and then they can add things that feel so much like their characters, you know. Sure, yeah. I mean... A lot of the stuff in New York, like I said, because I just, I mostly hang out at the Boston Comedy Club, um, uh, which is no longer here, but it was on West 4th, and it was a really well-known club in the 90s, and that's what, you know, I got to New York in 94, so 
actually Chappelle was just starting out there, Louis C.K. was there a lot, Jay Moore was there a lot, um, you know, Attell, like just a lot of comedians that we've now, you know, know have gotten bigger. And like I said, I just sort of watched it from a writing and performance point of view because really they do everything. They're their own directors in a way. In a way. And obviously there's that immediacy, which I think is what scares actors so much that they have to completely be there for the audience and be feeding off of them and knowing what to say back or if they get heckled, like, how do you deal with that, you know? So that was always fascinating to me and, uh, you know, I could watch that stuff forever, both when it works and when it doesn't. I think it's kind of, I just can't get enough. So I was very into that scene and I think I carried enough of it with me to feel comfortable writing it, like things like the Jay Moore character. I met a lot of guys like that. And again, there was no sort of, because it's such an honest world, like maybe guy, you know, if you were outside comedy saying something like, when are you going to fuck me, would be seen as very aggressive, which it is. But in the comedy world, it was super accepted. Like, Dina would have been seen as a weak person if she had been offended by that, you know. So it's just this, they say brutal stuff to one another. And again, it was for better or for worse, a world that I was comfortable with uh, and in. So, you know, despite having my issues with it. So that was sort of the first part. And then one of the things that really has changed since I was in that world is that now there's a lot more female comedians, which I remember seeing like one or two off in the 90s. And again, I know Sarah Silverman got big at that time and, you know, they started. And obviously there's some great female comedians. And, but now there's just so much more. Like now you go to the clubs and it's, you know, much more normal to see women there. So that was something that... This, you know, despite the sexism still inherent, like they're all still vying for only one spot. Um, I have to say all those ladies that are in those scenes are comedians, except for Ramona, I think, um, who's the one that does the, the introduction in the beginning and the, the laser guns, which is a <laughs> favorite thing of, me, of mine. But um, everybody else has been in that world. And I, you know, we had to go very quickly. I wish I would have had more time with them, but I think they... I, you know, I trusted them to be realistic, and it was, you know, especially the scene where Nina finds out she got it, and their reactions to it was hard, because again, I, I, I'm very cognizant of not being negative against women, and not showing women being shitty with one another, but I thought that was kind of like the the right response, where, you know, they're happy, and they want to be supportive of her, but they're also hurting, and Nina also acknowledges that, so again, it, it was kind of like cringe-worthy, that whole scene, but you know, a lot of credit goes to all of them. Nicole Byer, who's incredible, she does the Javala Slut impression um, and tours all the time. Andre, who's the blonde girl that does the Chelsea Handler impression. I mean, they're all veterans, so, you know, they know that world, obviously, even better than me. Well, I mean, it was important to me even before today's climate, and it obviously yeah. continues to be important, you know. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. It was very much my experience as a survivor, and I think that dichotomy you just mentioned was what was so important for me to show, because usually survivors are portrayed as these sort of, like, crying messes that are shriveled up in a corner, and though I think certainly a lot of us have been through nights like that, my experience of survivors, not just myself, is that we're really tough, because as the word implies, you've had to survive things that are really difficult and so a lot of us are really fucking strong and you never see that portrayed and sometimes it goes to the other way that because that that strength becomes an armor right and then it's also because you've been hurt in my case by men it becomes hard to then allow myself to love someone or to be loved in an intimate relationship which is also a lot of the impetus for the movie was to show that, that like even though she likes this guy and she can tell that he's a good guy, it's still really hard for her to open herself up to him. So yeah, I mean, that was, you know, a lot of what I wanted to show that what seems like a contradiction at first, but really, if you think about it, isn't, but I think it's very misunderstood. And as we're seeing now, you know, in view of the Me Too movement coming out, it's so prevalent, whether it's rape or abuse or, you know, harassment, um, it affects people, and I would like for others to think about that and have some more empathy. Uh, 
Uh, that's such a good question, and 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 you're right to to mention the fact that sometimes it's our own fear of whatever you know it may be that is holding us back, and that that's not to say that you shouldn't listen to that, you know. Um, I guess if any words of advice would be to be honest with yourself and to try not to let whatever whatever that fear is hold you back. Um, and I say that with caution because as we are seeing in today's world, you know, speaking out isn't always received well. For example, we saw that with Dr. Ford, you know, just a week ago that she went out there. I don't believe that in, that anybody doesn't actually believe that she's telling the truth. And that didn't seem to matter in terms of the decision that was made by, you know, a whole lot of senators on this country. So I'm not saying that necessarily speaking up the truth is always going to turn out well. Like you're saying, just because you want to, you know, pursue something doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. But I do feel like squaring with yourself and saying, what is it that I want? And how can I tell that honestly? Certainly in a creative way, it goes a long way. I feel like you know, if my movie is being understood at all, it's because at least it's honest. Even if people haven't gone through what I've gone through, they can understand what it is that's happening, you know? So I don't know if that makes sense, but I think honesty goes a long way, <laughs> even if it's scary. I just want to say thank you so much, Eva, for taking your time out to do this interview with me. I have to say I really enjoyed the film. The performances were fantastic. And the world you created was, uh, and for someone who's a fan of comedy and that type of uh, world, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with everything, and to put in such a strong message behind Nina to tell your story, I commend you wholeheartedly on everything you oh. put into that film. That's incredibly sweet and, and meaningful to hear, so thank you so much, and I appreciate your support as well. <laughs>